Hello team, in this lesson we are going to learn client-server architecture. Considering that web development is one of the key things of this course and client-server architecture is the most popular pattern for web applications nowadays, we have to learn it before proceeding with more advanced concepts. You need to understand what client-server architecture is and what its advantages and disadvantages. That is something what we are going to learn in the beginning of the lesson. After that, I will explain you the role of HTTP protocol in client-server architecture. Besides that, it will be important for us to learn another concept that is called a resource. Also, I will explain you what URI, URAN and URL are, and what is the difference between them. Let's start our lesson. And the first thing that I'd like to start with is the client-server architecture overview. Let's understand what it is. Client-server architecture is a popular network-based architecture that is very common nowadays. According to this approach, each computer acts as either server or a client. A centralized host computer that receives requests, processes them, and provides suitable response back is known as server. Workstations that initiate the request are called clients. For example, the Facebook. Facebook web application is hosted and deployed on the server. I can log in into my account and you can log in into your account in the Facebook. My and your computers are clients of the web application that is hosted and deployed on the server. Server is just another computer that handles requests from different clients. On receiving the request, server processes it, executes the required tasks, generates the response, and sends it back to the client. In client-server relationships, both the client and server carries out some data processing tasks at their end. The client-server architecture consists from three main components. They are client computer, server computer, and network. I hope you watched previous lesson about OSI model where we reviewed in details different layers of communication between devices in the network. I believe you already have high level understanding about client-server architecture. Let's try to understand it better through its advantages and disadvantages. I am going to start from advantages first. The first advantage is resource sharing. Imagine that you have printer in the office. You don't need to buy printer for each employee, correct? You can have one printer per the level in the building. Agreed? The same is here. You don't need to host application on multiple servers or make your users install application on their computers. You can create application, deploy it on the server, and clients from all over the world will start using it. Isn't this cool? In my course Java from Zero to the First Job, together with my students we create our own web application, our online store. This will help my students to understand how we can take an advantage of client-server architecture. Another important advantage is the easiness of maintenance. You have your application installed on the one computer on your server. And this application can handle millions of requests from different points in the world. In case you need to introduce some change, improvement or bug fix, you just need to implement this change and redeploy your web server. Web server is a place where web application is hosted. That's it. In case you would deal with desktop application, it wouldn't be so easy. Imagine that you need to force millions of people from different countries to install update of your application. It is something what is really hard to do. That's why we can state that maintenance and support of web application in some degree easier. We should never forget that maintenance and support of the server comes with additional costs on the hardware and sometimes on special software to administrate the server. So. Somebody may treat this as a something what is more complex, rather than easier. But still, to sum it up, 
I believe in general, supporting web applications that is built with client-server architecture and that interacts with millions of users, in general, simpler rather than supporting desktop with a similar workload. Also, you can manage resources as you wish. You can add resources to the one server instead of thousands of computers of the clients. You can remove, update resources when it is needed, delete, and read resources. Client-server architecture is more lightweight for the client. Client doesn't need a lot of space and memory in the computer to start using your app. The most complex configurations are already completed on the server side. The only things that client needs to have is a web browser and internet connection. That's it. Cost effectiveness. In the long run, costs spent for installation, support, and related services with a client server architecture, in general with a similar workload, would help to reduce costs. I know that after review of all these advantages, it will be hard to believe that this kind of architecture may have disadvantages. But still, there are some of them. Let's review them. Distribution of viruses or malware. Imagine that some resources contain virus. And these resources are in the network now and are available for millions of other users from all over the world. Definitely, risk of negative consequences is much higher in this case because multiple users may interact with this resource. Data security. How much cases have you heard when personal data was stolen from servers? Storing huge amount of data on the web server and providing interface to access it, even just for admins, means that we have risks of this data being stolen by attackers. That's why in web applications, in client-server architecture, there is always extra attention paid to the data security rules. And the last but not the least disadvantage that is often impacts different users is the next one. Servers may become bottleneck. Imagine that millions of users are trying to connect to the server simultaneously. Your application in turn makes millions of calls to the database. And physically, software and the hardware can't handle such load. In this case, server may become a bottleneck for all users. That's why after learning web development, we need to pay attention to the architecture of our server and make sure that we can scale it. Nowadays, cloud providers offer amazing opportunities for the scaling of the hardware components on request. Literally, like in few seconds, you can get few more instances of the servers or balance the load between different servers in different regions. But I am also talking about scaling your software architecture. Write your code in the way it can be scaled. That means multi-threading should be properly handled, logs on the database level should be managed effectively to not block other requests, transaction management should be implemented very careful to not block other operations, and lots more. Don't worry, we'll not be able to handle everything in one lesson, but gradually we are going to learn more and more. You have to believe me, I will make you a professional software engineer. I did this already many times. Let's continue. So, I believe you understood what a client-server architecture is. Now it is time to learn the details about how client may interact with the server. What do we use to exchange with messages, data? What I need to do to access the resource in the web? HTTP protocol is one of the protocols that may be used for communication and exchanging of messages between a client and a server. Let's understand the role of HTTP in the client-server architecture. I hope you watched the previous lesson about OSI model. If not, please watch it because it is mandatory to understand the things what I will talk about in this lesson. In particular, you have to know what TCP is, name of protocol data units like packets, frames that we learned in previous lesson with examples.
But still, let me recap it very briefly what HTTP protocol is on the real examples that we covered in the details in the previous lesson. As you can see on this slide, I want to compare HTTP protocol with message delivery. We have sender and receiver. In other terms, that is our client and the server. Sender sends the request. This is the client. Receiver receives the request, processes it, and returns a response. This is the server. Does it make sense? The client submits a HTTP request message to the server. The server which provides resources such as HTML files and other content or performs other functions on behalf of the client returns a response message to the client. The response contains completion status information about the request and may also contain requested content in its message body. A web browser is an example of user agent. Other types of user agents include the indexing software used by search providers, also called web crawlers, voice browsers, mobile apps, and other software that can access, consume, or display web content. If the concept is clear, let's move on. One more term that we already start using is the resource. What is the resource in web development? The target of an HTTP request is called a resource, whose nature isn't defined further. It can be a document, a photo, or anything else. So, basically everything in the web that you can access via HTTP protocol is a resource. You can create resources, update them, remove, and just read resources. A little bit later in the course we are going to learn HTTP methods that allow us to interact with resources. Now let's learn other important things. What is an URI? URI stands for Uniform Resource Identifier. Each resource is identified by a Uniform Resource Identifier URI, used throughout HTTP for identifying resources. There are different examples of URI. Some of them you can see on the slide. The first example contains the schema name, authority, path, query parameters. A URI doesn't need to contain all these components. All it needs is a scheme name and a file path, which can be empty. In the second example, telnet is the scheme name, and the numbers after the double slash make up the authority. The path is empty, which is why no characters come after the slash. Basically, there are two types of URIs. URNs Uniform resource names and URLs, uniform resource locators. A uniform resource name, URN, is a persistent and location independent identifier that follows the URN scheme. In this context, persistent means that the URN persists in identifying the same resource over time. An example of a URN provided by the RFC 3986 you can see on the slide. What is RFC? RFC stands for Request for Comments. The sequence of numbered RFCs are the published specifications for most internet-related standards. RFC 3986 is a specification for URI syntax. You can check it if you wish. The analogy of the URN from the real life is Google Docs. If you have ever used Google Docs, you know that the document has a unique identifier and it is not changed no matter in which folder a resource is located or moved. Even in case you would move the doc to another folder, the URN will remain the same. Is that clear? With regards to URN, to be honest, as a software engineers, we will not deal with URN as often as we will deal with URL. Example of URN you can see on the slide. Probably you also heard another term, URL. What is a URL? URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator. A URL is a location-dependent identifier 
that is not necessarily persistence, meaning URLs are not required to identify the same resource over time. URLs also do not follow the URN scheme. URL is a sequence of characters that identifies the network location of a resource. Besides identifying a resource, URLs help to locate the resource by describing its primary access location. For example, a URL might contain FTP, HTTP, or HTTPS when the resource is a web type data. This tells us that the resource can be located and accessed via file transfer protocol, hypertext transfer protocol, or hypertext transfer protocol secure. Also, URL may have mail to prefix if the resource is an email address. On the slide, you can see example of the syntax of a URL. You'll notice that these look similar to the URI examples mentioned before. That's because they contain many of the same components, including pass and query. However, a URL contains unique components, such as protocol and domain. To sum it up, the differences between URI and URL are the following ones. URL is a subset of URI that specifies where a resource exists and the mechanism for retrieving it, while URI is a superset of URL that identifies a resource. The main aim of URL is to get the location or address of a resource, whereas the main aim of URI is to find a resource. URL contains components such as protocol, domain, pass, query parameters, etc., while URI contains components like scheme, authority, pass, query, etc. Great! Since we talked about client-server architecture and HTTP role in it, I had to explain what a resource is, and taking into account we learned what a resource is, I had to explain what URI, URN, and URL are. That's all for this lesson. Let's recap what we have learned today. Today we learned what client-server architecture is. I explained you advantages and disadvantages of this type of architecture. After that, I explained the role of HTTP protocol in client-server architecture. We are still going to have a separate lesson dedicated to HTTP only. So, stay tuned! Also, I explained such popular concept in web development as a resource. Now you know what it is. And at the end of the lesson, we learned what URI, URN, and URL are. I hope that now you understand the difference between these terms. That's it. Thanks a lot for your attention. Have a great day and see you in the next lesson.